Dartmouth College basketball players are not just athletes, they are employees able to negotiate salaries, practice, and travel schedules. That's what a National Labor Relations Board official ruled this week, clearing the path for a union vote. Dartmouth can still appeal the decision, and the case could go all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, it's not the first time college athletes have tried unionizing. The same official body that is greenlighting Dartmouth shut down Northwestern football players one decade ago. So what makes this case different? Joining me now is David Ridpath, sports business professor at Ohio University. If this is successful, what sort of doors does this decision open up for college athletes across the board? You know, I think, Simona, that you know, it, it is a significant decision, but it's only a, a step. The fact that the Ivy League schools are all, are all private and the NLRB governs private organizations, it certainly can be significant for the Ivy League and it can be an incubator for other things to happen. Plus, there's a lot of private schools in the NCAA already uh, that might be interested in doing this. Uh, honestly, personally, I think this is inevitable in some fashion. This might just be a start and a template for others to follow. Dartmouth has said that their athletes are like their musicians that are in the orchestra because everything there is academic based. You know, athletes there don't get scholarships for playing simply for financial need. Does that become too far reaching then if these college athletes are getting paid? Should musicians in the orchestra be getting paid? Well, I would tell you in my experience that my daughter is a fine arts graduate from Ohio University, and there's no fine arts person that the half dozen universities I've worked at that is under the same restrictions and policies that a college athlete is. So I would challenge anybody on that, not saying that they don't exist, but to literally have every waking hour of your day controlled. Uh, and those controls are more of an employee employer control, meaning uh, punitive measures, getting dismissed from the team, losing a scholarship. If you don't, if you don't do this, you might lose playing time. Those are things that typically a fine arts graduate in my experience doesn't have to deal with, with all due respect to them, like I said, my daughter is one, but there's really no fair comparison. Do you anticipate Dartmouth is appealing this? You know, I would imagine, but I, what I would like to see, Simone, is, is for smart people to get together, dissenters and, and supporters alike uh, of the current model to forge a path ahead, because I don't think Congress is going to give the NCAA the lifeline they want, and things like this are inevitable. You can't say that somebody is a student and treat them as an employee without giving them all the rights that employees have, including collective bargaining as a union. It simply doesn't work. You can't hide behind the student athlete moniker and claim that they are just students doing an extracurricular activity. When I can tell you, even here at Ohio University, it's a highly professionalized enterprise. Mm -hmm. If they do appeal, how far could this process go? Does this go all the way to the Supreme Court? You know, I would think so. I, I think we've seen a lot of major uh, issues. Uh, you know, the Alston case, the O'Bannon case recently uh, have all gone uh, to the Supreme Court, or at least on their way to the Supreme Court, I should say. I could see this absolutely uh, going that far. David, what makes this different from what Northwestern football players tried to do a decade ago? No, not much different. The issue was is that the Big Ten is uh, an organization that also has public schools. So that was one where uh, Northwestern would have had to go it alone. And part of the issue why the NLRB did not take jurisdiction in that case was that there were public institutions in the Big Ten. The Ivy League is all private. This could have far reaching implications for all the Ivy League schools and, and certainly something again that, that, that other schools could follow or private schools that are primarily in the Big East Conference, for instance, the basketball conference might be able to follow. Uh, again, I just look at it as a possible template and a pathway forward for all schools, public and private. What does that tell us though about how difficult this would be as far as widespread consequences are concerned if you're saying, well, this works for a private school in the Ivy League conference where everybody's private, but a school like Northwestern, which is in the Big 10 with a bunch of public universities, wouldn't have been able to achieve the same thing. Yeah, there's certainly those difficulties. And I'm, you know, I'm not a labor law expert, but certainly, you know, there's, when you get into public uh, institutions, there's, there's right to work states. There's some states that don't have, that have anti-union laws. There's a lot of complications, but I also think it's something that can be overcome by the public schools. If indeed uh, the leaders of the NCAA know that any rules that they put in place going forward that restrict the athlete are likely going to be overturned in court.
like transfer restrictions, uh, NIL restrictions. Those will likely be ter- overturned in court based upon the Alston ruling by the Supreme Court that you would hope that these people, Simone, would get together and say, you know what, if we want to protect ourselves from antitrust lawsuits, the only way to do that is to collectively bargain restrictions with the athletes. Then I think it can be done at the public and private level, certainly at the NCAA level. And it is something they should really, really consider. Does any of the difference between Dartmouth and Northwestern, obviously different premises here, but is any of the difference have to do with the fact that a decade has gone by and we've seen how the Supreme Court has been treating the NCAA's amateurism status to date? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we evolve in everything, Simone, and, and certainly the Northwestern uh, effort was groundbreaking. Um, it was when the NCAA was on a little bit stronger footing with their, you know, uh, we're protecting the athlete by keeping them amateurs. And they had survived on that for so many years. It worked for them. Saying that they were student athletes worked for them. But it was always a house of cards that was doomed to crumble. And 10 years later, we're miles ahead of where we were. But the Northwestern case was certainly one of those things that took a few cards out of the, the base and started the uh, the whole thing tumbling down. And, and certainly this is another nail in the coffin. I think, Simone, the inevitability is, is that we're going to have to declare at least segments of college athletes' employees, allow them to collectively bargain any restrictions or compensation, and then we should be able to move forward. But if we're, if we're going to continue to try to keep some type of, this is about education, this is about amateurism, and this is about love of the game, I think we're kidding ourselves, and we need to look at reality and not look at what we want college athletics to be. We have to deal with what it is. And in any case, Simone, we're going to watch the games. So let's be fair to the players. A Northwestern football player who led that charge, Kane Coulter, had said, you know, looking back on it, that if they were to do it all over again, they would have said that not only were they Northwestern employees, but employees of the Big Ten and the NCAA as a whole. Is that a path forward? I certainly think so. I mean, you know, when you bargain, you have to have a competing entity, right? So, you know, if I'm we're trying to unionize our faculty here at Ohio University, and so certainly we would negotiate with the university. Um, I think being employees of a conference might be an idea uh, that could actually work uh, and kind of get out of the kind of the public private school uh, issue uh, where the, you know, the Big Ten could be, you know, a private entity or a public entity for all of its members. And that could be a way it could work. Given this Dartmouth decision, what do you think is more likely? Are there going to be a lot of piecemeal labor movements that ripple throughout college sports? Or will the NCAA admit that athletes are employees earlier than that and make some sort of wider agreement? The NCAA is probably going to fight this till their last breath. Instead of being proactive, I think they're going to be very reactive and they're going to continue to lose in court. They're going to continue to lose at the legislative level, state and federal level, and they're going to continue to lose in the court of public opinion. And eventually they'll be forced, sadly, The NCAA mechanism has been one that is very arrogant, uh, has a lot of hubris. You have a lot of people that want to protect their piece of the pie. So their changes probably are going to have to be forced rather than them coming and actually evolving and sitting down and working on real solutions. Well, there are no shortage of cases against the NCAA, as you just alluded to. So we look forward to talking to you more about those. David Ridpath, thank you so much for your time. Simone, thanks so much. 